Shabbat Shalom Holy way of the Most High Om Shabbat Shalom I sense your presence Om Shabbat Shalom Holy way of the Most High Om Shabbat Shalom I sense your presence and I am the light within your soul In the essence of truth and right Love makes the circle whole And here we stand in line Waiting for some sacred sign But to find the balance is the purpose of this time to restore the balance of the universal mind And in the presence of my Lord of light and love Everything I see is firing to be free And when I call to thee And come on bending knee Surrender to the all-pervading light and love Reflections of the one surrounding me with love And I sense your presence I sense your presence I sense your presence I sense your presence Within and without, above and below, yeah. East, west, north, and south, I sense your presence. Without and within, below and above, yeah, yeah. East, west, north, and south, I sense your presence. I sense your presence. Shabbat 
Shabbat Shalom, Holy Angel of the Most High. Oh, Shabbat Shalom, I sense your presence. I sense your presence. And thank you for joining me here on Code Connection. My name is Jesse Ann Nichols George, and I am your hostess. And that music that you were listening to at the beginning of the show is called I Sense Your Presence. It's by Shemshai. And, uh, you know, definitely check out more of Shemshai's work. You know, they've been very kind to let me use their music on the show. And um, you can check out their work at www.shemshai.com. That's S-H-I-M-S-H-A-I.com. And I want to extend a welcome to everybody who's listening to us today. I know that some have been listening to me since way back over the years of, of doing Activating Compassion, which started about three years ago. And um, and recently, if you listened in last week, you know that we have shifted and the show is shifting. And um, some of the areas and topics and things that we're dealing with is shifting a little bit. And it is now called Code Connection. So if you came here thinking, hey, I was going to listen to Activating Compassion today, it's okay. You're still in the right place. <laughs> You're still in that realm. Only uh, Code Connection is taking us into some deeper realms and some very interesting things. And you're actually going to find that I'm going to be doing more and more of my own show in addition to having guests and looking at actual codes of things in the universe. So I think it's really interesting around here, and I really appreciate everybody bearing with me as I make the shift both on the show and the website, all through my social media and all the other places <laughs> that I've got things out there. And by the way, we do stream live in three additional places, which is Talk Stream Live, Stream Finder, and Pen, known as Pair Encounters Network. And I welcome everybody listening to you there as well, in addition to those catching our archives on TuneIn.com, iTunes, and through the YouTube channel. And what we do here is we um, are looking at living a more compassionate life by aligning with your personal life code. And many times I'm going to still have guests on the show so that you can learn about their work and how other things may be an option for your code energy because code energy is very personalized and it's very individualized. And so while one person might, for example, do very well with access consciousness, somebody else might not do well with that. And they might need somebody that does tapping or things like this. So this gives you a variety of different options to look at and and in finding something that really resonates for you. I also will still be highlighting different musical artists along the way. Last week, as a matter of fact, we had Shashika Maru, who called in from India, and that was such a blessing. I've had Woven Green on, Dragon's Head has been on the air this year, Angela, um, Angelia Grace, who called in from Ireland, has been on this year. I've got CJ Monsia coming up uh, on the Autumn Equinox, so Lots of great musical guests. I like to correlate them with the turning of the year, so listen in for those guests as well. And uh, CJ is going to be very interesting because he doesn't just do music, but he's also a shamanic practitioner, and he's got his own way of aligning things and, and working with things, and so that's going to be fun as well. And there's going to be just a variety of different topics, tools, resources, and thoughts that are going to be shared on the show, and that's going to allow for your personal exploration, universal insights, and expanding your perception of how life works. So what I do in my own work is I focus on helping people find and use compassion in their everyday life, but now I'm also helping people connect with their own personal code and their own code alignment uh, with other people, situations, employers, all kinds of things uh, out there all through the universe so that they can get more in the flow with things, so that they can actually get into what's working for them as an individual. In addition, I've created the Genesis Clearing Statement. If you've missed that, you can catch that through interviews that other people have done of me. Matter of fact, uh, Kevin Baird, who used to be a host on the network here, and he's, we had him on just a couple of weeks ago, as a matter of fact, with New Companion, uh, did a show where he interviewed me, and uh, that was really great. You can catch that. I've also authored four books, uh, the most recent being You, Me, Life Dreams, and its companion workbook, which is for relationships and the masculine and feminine energy. And then my first two books, Activating Compassion and its companion workbook. And I've also um, created, well, it used to be the Compassion Tour, and now it's shifted and it's become the True North Tour, 
which is a multi-state nationwide tour, including workshops, retreats, all kinds of things, seminars, book signings, um, private session work with people in person. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Matter of fact, I'm going to be back in the East Coast region coming up in October. I'm going to be in the Fairfax, Washington, D.C. region. Uh, in October, I'm going to be in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, and I'm also going to be in Westford, Massachusetts, near the uh, Boston region. So if you're out around that way and you want to connect, either stop into one of the venues I'm going to be at or one of the events I have going on out there. Um, I'm going to be taking private sessions on that part of the tour. And, um, you know, or just say, hey, you're passing through my area. Can we connect? <laughs> and if I can work it in, I will definitely work it in. It's a little bit of a tight schedule this time around because I only have a couple of weeks to work with. But um, if I can make it happen, I definitely will do it. And just a reminder, if you enjoyed the show today, share it with other people because I know when I share things, People go, oh, my gosh, that was amazing, or that guest did a great exercise on the show, and, and that really helped me out a lot, or that was just what I needed to, to tune in with right now. And they can come into the show by the very same link that you use uh, to get into our live show today, and they can listen to it in their archive. Also, it's available as a podcast through iTunes, TuneIn.com, and then my YouTube channel. And I say give me up to two weeks, even though most of the time, I get it done within a couple of days, so you can look for that there as well. Now, those that have listened to my show before, they know I like to bring in a little insight for the week. And this insight comes from Yehuda Burke, who is a Kabbalah master, and he deals in what's called the 72 names of God. And, and in my code work, one of the things I'm looking at with people is different names of God um, to work with. And because... We want it, again, kind of personalized. You know, a lot of people use a generic term or they, they work with something based on their belief system. But when we tune into that name of God that really works for us, it just really, it's like having all the prayers answered rapidly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people say it accelerates things. That's, that's kind of the way I hear it expressed by a lot of people I've been working with. So what we have today from Yehuda, and this thought, by the way, does go up on my page of the Main Street Universe tab on my website, um, and that way you can go back and reflect on it through the week there. So the, the common name of God that we have this week is eliminating negative thoughts. And this little uh, message on this is when obsessive thoughts, worry, anxiety, fear, pessimism, uncertainty, and negative fantasies invade us, we can take our minds back and focus on thoughts that move us forward and not backwards. And the insight he provides on this is, thoughts do not originate from the physical matter of the brain. The brain is merely a radio that broadcasts thoughts to the rational mind. So where does the actual broadcast come from? Kabbalah teaches that there are two distinct sources the light force and the dark force. And these are like two separate broadcasting stations, and they're on the air 24 hours a day. Here's the problem. The dark force of ego has control over the airwaves of our mind. 24-7, at full volume, negative and egocentric thoughts dominate our consciousness. The dark force is the source of all our fears and doubts. In comparison, thoughts that come to us from the light are barely noticeable. It's only when we manage to tune out the signal transmitting from the dark force that we're able to hear the faint sounds of our own soul. Recurrent thoughts include uncertainty, constant worrying, dread, and excessive fear to the point where we become ridden with anxiety. Negative thoughts also include those terrible things that we think about other people when they aggravate us or those harsh judgments we wish upon others when we envy them. Obsessive compulsive behavior also begins with uncontrollable negative ideas. Shutting down our negative mental processes frees the mind and automatically curbs obsessive behavior. A cold heart is an opening for an onslaught of harmful, unproductive thoughts. When our hearts become open and warm, we seal these openings once and for all. And the meditation that he provides for this is, you are now switching off destructive thoughts 
emanating from the ego. In the space that has been opened, a gentle radiance of spiritual light floods your heart and mind. And again, the common name is eliminating negative thoughts. The formal name that he provides on this is I am Mohamed Mem. I am Mohamed Mem. And it's going to be interesting since our guest today is dealing with NLP or Neuro Linguistic Programming and patterns in our thoughts. And so <laughs> it's going to be kind of fun to see if she has anything to say on that. Now, one more aspect for us just to kind of get us in the mode of where our show is headed today um, before we go on break and get our guest on the show here. And this will just kind of move us in the direction of, of where we're headed today. What if, you're, what if you were a natural at something? Actually, this is not the, uh, not the one that I had for this week. Give me just a moment here. I'm going to bring that up. It's really amazing how I... Uh, jump around every now and then, and it's been a really kind of, if we want to say hectic week, (laughs) along the way for me, and um, and so definitely I apologize for that little look there, because we have an interesting guest, and she's actually going to be dealing in something today that um, a piece of the work we're going to delve into that, that talks about the pattern is called Family Constellation. And I think that you're going to find this really, really interesting. Okay, so here we are with a little thought (laughs) on today's topic. Does the way we state things influence the way our brain receives the information? And does our brain need certain components in order to have clarity so that it can process what is being asked of us to an action? Can shifting how we communicate change our behaviors and help us live in a greater clarity? Now, many are familiar with the basics of NLP, or Neuro Linguistic Programming. However, not everyone is familiar with the foundations of how it works and the potential it has to help us. Basically, as we speak with each other, we either provide or don't provide what the brain needs to process the communication. And this then allows us to receive something with clarity or confusion. And oftentimes, I would say that most people feel that They're very clear in their communication. However, how many of us stop and actually consider if we've spoken clearly without linguistic distortions, specified generalizations, and recovered deleted information in our our statement? And it is said that when these components are present, that a complete representation of the communication is provided, and that this can then provide therapeutic benefits. It can actually create a trance-like state, allowing the brain to receive suggestions. Now, certainly this is just one aspect of NLP, and there are many components that can be included with it. However, what's interesting to me is its therapeutic effects and its ability to transform the patterns that many of us live in, both consciously and unconsciously. So imagine being able to treat illnesses change behaviors that we don't want, and set forth a path of living that we truly enjoy, all through strong communication. And Leslie Nip is one person that focuses on exactly these aspects. And I have to apologize to her because when I wrote my blog post, I realized that <laughs> I put in the wrong name. <laughs> in there, so I definitely apologize for that. But she's one person that focuses on exactly these aspects, and she works with people to shift and change the patterns they are in so that they can live a life that they truly enjoy. And she helps them to find a sense of flow in the world through the use of NLP techniques. And I find this work really interesting, knowing that words and word combinations have vibrations, and those vibrations then can create different results in our lives. And that's definitely something to pay attention to because I would tend to say that this could strongly connect with the law of resonance and the law of attraction principles. And I know it definitely connects with coding because words and the word vibrations and the combinations that we use definitely have an impact on what happens in our coding. So could shifting our language really bring a stronger sense of peace into our lives? And could adjusting our communication allow us to release those long-standing patterns that frustrate us? And how aware are you 
of your communication and how they affect others. And that kind of brings us to just a great aspect of where we are for today and um, what we're dealing with today. So the code for this week then is related to strengthening your mind. And it reminds you that you can be all powerful in your life. And as we let go of our addictions and attachments, we set aside material things by choice. And this does not happen due to suffering or deprivation, but because we do not let them control us. And it happens by realizing that our fulfillment is not in the material world, even if we can enjoy what that material world has to offer. And when we are not controlled by material things, we stop desiring them and making them a priority. We also stop being controlled by others. And we become a person that is ruled by no one, truly free to exist as our spiritual self and to thus fully enjoy this world as well. So again, you can find actually this code for the week along with Yehuda's um, message for the week on my page of the Main Street Universe tab on my website, Jesse Ann Nichols George, the number one, dot com. I'm going to take a short break, and when we return, I'm going to have Leslie Ness with me sharing her work with NLP and Pattern and Family Constellations. The song I've got for you during our break is called I Am Spinning, and it's by Claire Hadeen. And uh, also greatly appreciate Claire you allowing us to use her work on the show or her music on the show and um, and welcome that, and definitely check out more of her work through her website, www.clairehedin.com. That's C-L-A-R-E-H-E-D-I-N.com. We'll be back in just a few minutes.
and welcome back. You are listening to Code Connection, and my name is Jesse Ann Nichols George, and I am your hostess today. You were just listening to a song called I Am Spinning by Claire Hedin, and you can check out more of Claire's work at www.clairehedin.com. That's C L A R E H E D I N.com. And today I have with me Reverend Leslie Metz, and she's an Episcopal priest. NLP, and Family Constellations Practitioner. She brings passion to her work, curiosity, delighted amazement at the human and cosmic condition, and faith in the trustworthiness of our lives. NLP and Family Constellations help us understand the patterns that often create havoc and bring pain to our lives. Ultimately, they are expressions of our need for safety and belonging. NLP and Family Constellations work Help us revise these patterns so that we can live a richer, more choiceful life. And Leslie has a rich combination of experience and engagement to bring to your practical dilemmas. She focuses on helping you to discover a new way with your problems that brings hope and gratitude for the remarkable honor of being human. We will be looking at our work today with NLP and the patterning in our lives, the family consciousness, and you can learn more about her work at www.lesliemetz.com. That's L S, I'm sorry, L E S L I E N I P P S dot com. And I just want to say, Leslie, welcome to Code Connection. It's a pleasure to have you on the show as a guest today. Well, thank you for having me, Jesse. What fun. Yeah, thank you. And, um, you know, I would love for you to start off by sharing a little bit about your journey into this work. Like why, you know, what brought you into this? Why NLP? Why Family Constellations? Really good question. <laughs> thank you for having me on the show. This is really, I've already learned a great deal in the first half hour, so... Thank you for your teaching. Um, it's already been of great benefit to me. Um, why NLP and why Family Constellations is an awfully good question. Um, I am 51 years old, so I do hope this is my last career. <laughs> I've been through a few at this point. Um, as you mentioned, I am an Episcopal minister. I did pretty conventional uh, uh parish ministry um, for a dozen years or so, uh, which was very rich and very wonderful, uh, doing spiritual leadership. Uh, It it was in that path that I pursued that part of my calling around asking the biggest, deepest questions about our spiritual selves and how to be in community around that. Um, Having said that, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone who's listening. Conventional church has um, got a lot of challenges these days, uh, institutionally. And so after a while, that just stopped being my life's calling. Uh, I'm still an Episcopal minister. Uh, I still dabble in that realm from time to time. I still love my clergy colleagues. I think they're doing really beautiful and important work. Um, But uh, I ended up transitioning out of that, uh, spent a little bit of time not knowing what I was going to do, to be honest. I spent a little time teaching in the local jails, which I really liked doing. I spent a little bit of time uh, working in nonprofits. I worked for Meals on Wheels of San Francisco for a, a while. And I encourage everyone to support your local Meals on Wheels, which helps seniors eat in your communities. Um, I think they do really beautiful work, too. Um, but eventually, I, I, you know, in hindsight, you know, there, there are no um, accidents, but still at the time, it felt like I'd stumbled into a school that was teaching NLP and Family Constellations. And as for many of us, um, it started out by feeling like it might have some answers for some of the things I was struggling with right? Um, My own persistent patterns that in my 40s um, were were still very persistent um, and painful. 
And both of these modalities began to help me. And as I learned more and more about them, I discovered not only were they helpful to me, they were helpful to other people. And uh, interestingly enough, I was kind of good at it. Uh, And uh, as someone who's always had kind of a a vocational approach to my work, what is my calling, uh, that felt very, very vocational to me. And so seven years later, I have a practice I work uh, both in private with general healing clients of all kinds using both both of these modalities, um, do groups as well, and I've also developed a bit of a, a side specialty in helping some of my fellow alternative practitioners and coaches develop their, pra- their practices because I've dis- dis- discovered that folk like us have um, some – uh, kind of particular difficulties and obstacles to growing their businesses that I figured out a little bit. So that's part of what I do as well. And that's how I've ended up where I am. Well, it's interesting. I can relate to going through a lot of careers and, and going, I yeah. hope this is it. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> and I know with working with the code work that I'm doing now, um, you know, it definitely feels like it and like you, it resonates that, um, yeah. you know, it clicks in and it connects. And I was I was just sitting here looking, and for people that are wondering, it, it's very interesting as I make this shift in my own work right now, um, the guests that I have scheduled, like yourself, because we booked a while back. <laughs> and um, and very interesting that NLP is, is coded to you. Yeah. And I was sitting yeah. here going, I'm going to stop and look at this, and it's it's definitely coded to you. So it's it's fun to see this come together, oh. where the, the people that are on are sharing, you know, are are fitting into this um, work. Yeah. So it's 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 exciting to see that come together. And you talk about the conventional church, and absolutely, there's a lot of different things. And and ironically, and I I have nothing I was against conventional churches. I I was raised Presbyterian myself. Um, but their their code energy is about um, disruption and unexpected upheaval. <laughs> and it's one of the reasons that I think they're coming under a lot of scrutiny right now in these times with the planetary influences of Uranus retrograde, for example, which is all about that and uh, and having these different energies. So it's very fun to have you on. And I think that you came into it in a way that, is powerful for a lot of people and in some ways it can seem very mundane but but it's very powerful when we come in and go wow this is what works for me how does this work for you yeah. and and you start finding that natural niche in it so i would love for you to share a little bit about um give us a little brief thing about nlp um, yeah, for people, uh, just for those that might not be completely familiar with it. Yeah, and it's um, part of the difficulty with explaining NLP. I think there's two issues. Um, one is less a coherent m- modality and more a toolkit. You know, with with a wrench and a hammer and a screwdriver and a tape measure. Yeah. Um, so that's mm-hmm. one thing that can make it a little bit difficult to explain to people. The other one, which is true for many other modalities, is it has lots of different lineages. And so in different lineages, how NLP is presented can be quite different. Um, if any of your listeners who are new to NLP were to just Google NLP right now, they might be surprised that 90% of what they find is either related to sales or, or related to speed seduction of all things. Um, and the reason why is because NLP is interested in how we influence the unconscious in order to have the outcomes that we would like to have. And as, as you know, this can be used for good or for ill. Yeah. And so um, the lineage that I was trained in is a therapeutic lineage, which is very beautiful and is very supportive of uh, human wholeness and wellness. 
um, using these tools to help us uncover um, the patterns that are getting in our way and in a very appreciative and tender way um, to invite our unconscious to not break our patterns, not overcome our patterns, but to revise them gently so we actually become more of who we naturally are is the way I like to think about it. Um, it's The thing I love about NLP is it's fundamentally appreciative. So if, if anyone on the call right now thinks of any of the patterns or behaviors that is – most driving them nuts right now, which if they could wave the magic wand, that would be the thing they could change, either with the way they eat or depression or money or whatever it might be. The assumption of NLP is that that pattern exists because there's a perception that it's keeping us safe or it is helping us to belong to our families. And the reason why that pattern is so uh, persistent is because it feels dangerous to our brains and to our spirits for it to be different, even though our higher consciousness know it would actually be better if it were different. Yeah? Um, so from that point of view, none of us are broken. Uh, none of us are weak. Um, we do all have safety patterning that took really good care of us when we were children and in the context of our families, not only our, the families we grew up with, but our ancestral context as well, which I can go into later. Um, but they're a little out of date um, for the adult experience we'd like to have now. And so uh, NLP um, was put together by two slightly crazy guys in Santa Cruz in the 70s who borrowed a lot of tools from a lot of different practitioners. They basically modeled out excellence in therapists and in other uh, professions as well um, and gathered this group of tools uh, that actually help us to get in communication, and that was what you were saying before, get in communication with the unconscious in a very elegant way to allow for the kind of changes we'd like to have. So I'll stop there and see if you have a question that comes from there. That's my my first attempt to summarize. <laughs> well, I, I think that it's interesting what you're bringing up there because, um, yeah, I think a lot of people I, – I, I, I've delved a bit, a bit into the programming aspects of, you know, how so many of these yeah. things do get programmed in from childhood and and um I think I think those two guys would still be crazy if they were from <laughs> Santa Cruz cuz Santa Cruz is like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um Oh no no, I don't blame Santa Cruz for that, but you know, they're just <laughs> interesting gentlemen, Bandler and Grinder, too. Our founders, <laughs> founders of modalities are often interesting on the edge people. They they are, and I think that that you know that area in particular was was considered very out yeah. of the box as well as today. Yeah. But um, I I was gonna have you also get into a little bit about you know how we create these patterns, which I think is kind of where you started mm -hmm. to head toward. Yeah. Um, because I think that's the question. It's like okay. I get it that we, we develop these patterns, and, and, and I love that you brought out that oftentimes we carry these patterns over. There's something in those patterns that we're getting something out of. Um, yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't hold on to them. You know, if we weren't getting yeah. something somehow. I think a lot yeah. of times people get confused, and they're not sure what it is they're getting out of that pattern uh, because yeah. it seems like something that they don't want. Um, so I guess maybe maybe have you go in that direction yeah. and tell us a little bit more about how they get created. Yeah. Sure. Um, so there's a lot of different frameworks for answering that question. You, in a way, offered one at the beginning of this of this radio show. Um, for NLP, the main framework is asking some questions about the fight flight 
structures of our brains. Um, it's not the only way to look at it, but it, it, I find it very useful. Um, so when we're very small children, uh, that part of our brain, the survival part of our brain, is growing like crazy. And it's learning like crazy. Yeah? Uh, you know, this tastes good and that doesn't taste good. And mom will let me do this, but not let me do that. And no, oh, we speak English here, not Spanish, right? It's learning like crazy. And one of the things it's learning is um, about how to handle danger and how to handle experiences that either are authentically uh, threatening to survival or at least seem that way, like our parents fighting every night. Um, And the child somehow gets through it, right? We know that. Why? Because we're having this conversation, right? Somehow they survive the experience. And what happens is that that fight-flight part of the brain makes a whole lot of meanings about what helps them survive. Yeah? Um, often beautiful, but not necessarily very accurate <laughs> uh, <laughs> meanings about what helps them survive. That ex- so let's say we have a dad who yells a lot, and we as a child ended up being very quiet. Okay, in response to that. And the learning could be, oh, because I was quiet, I survived that. And then we become adults who have this experience of kind of being more quiet than we want to be, than is really helpful per- perhaps for our relationships or careers. But somewhere down there in that very deep survival level uh, imprint, there's the meaning Oh, to stay alive, I've got to stay quiet. Yeah. Now, you and I could have a conversation with that person and say, you know, hon, I don't think it was the fact that you were quiet that you survived. I think you survived because your father wasn't so crazy as to kill you. Right? He had a limit, he had a boundary about that, right? Um, he was scary, we get it. He was very frightening. Um, but you didn't actually keep him from making you die. He actually had an internal boundary. Um, But we grow up into the kind of person who is convinced, again, unconsciously, this is all running very unconsciously, very few of these patterns are at the level of conscious awareness. Um, But at the unconscious level, there's this very intense feeling of, uh, I better be quiet if I want to live through this. Yeah. Um, whereas the conscious mind of this person perhaps who comes to me for work who would like to market their business more or do public speaking or stick up for themselves in their relationship with their spouse is saying, you know, I, I, I know that if I speak I'm not going to die, so I, you know, I don't know what the problem is here. Um, so we need to get in rapport with the part of the um, consciousness which is still quite convinced that staying quite quiet is absolutely necessary for survival. And this is the place NLP works. Um, With its whole toolkit, um, having a a beautiful, appreciative conversation with that part of our consciousness. So one question that we often ask very early on in an interaction, if someone says, I would like to stick up for myself more in my relationships, Excellent. That sounds wonderful. I'd really like that for you, too. What might you lose that you value if you could do that? And they, you know, they kind of blink a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) And their first answer is usually nothing. Everything would be better. And we're like, I I do understand. I agree with you. Your conscious mind knows that everything would be better. But is there some part that thinks that there's something you might lose that you value? And then we've got a conversation. This is where the linguistics part comes in. Asking these really interesting, slightly upside-down questions that help us get to, again, a really appreciative rapport with the parts of our consciousness that are in charge of these what are called unwanted present states. And that's how we get started. 
Well, and it's it's interesting. Um, part of what I'm hearing you say with this process and part of how NLP works on our patterns is to engage both parts of our brain, yes. the right and the left, as opposed to just one side of the brain. Um, and I, I get this because in some of the workshops I've done, I've asked people to go go back and think about, you know, what were your dynamics at, say, four years old, five years old, yeah. um, where we really are, are forming these patterns. And, you know, they'll initially say, I don't remember anything, for example. And then, yeah. and then pretty soon as they start to think about it or I start to talk a little bit um, or share something for myself, they go, you know, I remember so-and-so doing this. And then it starts to yeah. unfold, and that's like it taps into that creative brainstorming side um, of the mind in there. Uh, so this, this is really interesting um, when, I, when I start to look at that. Is that it has a bunch of nifty little hypnotic tools for helping people really step into that childhood imprint and get the information about what that child learns. Because we can be astonished to discover that in that moment we learned, I'm worthless. Um, I don't count for much. Um, uh, Keeping quiet makes me safe. Any number of things that we we had no idea that we learned so intensely at that moment. So having a few tools to help people, instead of think about it from an intellectual place, from a memory place, to actually re-enter the consciousness of, say, the four-year-old experience. So actually getting into that four-year-old self. And it's amazing how much we can start to open into that self once we get started and how many little things that we've set aside and forgotten. And I think that self-worth pattern is a big thing. I don't know, maybe you've experienced that with the clients you've worked with because that seems to be foundational to relationships working, success working in our life, Um, whether we succeed at something, that sense of self-worth or value um, or being able to be part of a, a group. Um, I, I know I did a lot of work on myself before <laughs> before I went on tour and, you know, really delving into this area. So I can relate to it to go, oh, my gosh, I was the one that, you know, was kind of shoved off. Like I, I think about it now and I think maybe that's why I've had a hard time fitting in with some groups. You know, part of it's my coding and things like that, but I – when you look at these programs that were run that said, you know, no, you don't get to be a part of the decision-making like the rest of the family or, <laughs> you know, do yeah. things. and there's some things. You don't think about them being a bad thing then, you know, because up until a couple of years ago, if anybody had said, you know, how was your family life growing up, I would have said, oh, my gosh, I had an amazing family life. And, mm-hmm. um and, and I think I still had a good life in a lot of ways. Don't get me wrong yeah, there. Sure. But, sure. We can have both. These, like, yeah, the programs come out more and more. So yeah. so how do we then take NLP, for example, and apply that to these patterns? You say asking questions, um, getting back into that. Can you give us more of an example of of that? Sure. So um, a lot of people talk about having issues perhaps with self-worth or self-esteem sometimes is the way they put it. Um, What I'm always curious about is what flavor, because it actually ends up mattering a whole lot. Um, Is it the version like you mentioned, like I don't really belong here? Or is it the version that I mentioned, which is if 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 um, if I'm too noisy, I'll be in danger? Or is it the kind where this is a really heartbreaking one that shows up a lot 
um, my mom's pain matters more than mine or things like that. Or my mom's wellness matters more than mine, that kind of thing. And so, um, as I mentioned, what we do is we, we both explore. It's interesting, even before we do, I often sort of almost forbid clients to talk about their childhood because we do have an official story, whether it's a good official story or a negative one, that's, that can be useful but often um, uh, hides some of the more interesting things that may have happened. And sometimes what we're looking for is a fresh look. So what I do is I start with the actual problem. The, the current day, what's the problem? I don't have good self-esteem. Oh, okay, thank you for sharing that with me. How do you experience poor self-esteem? Under what circumstances? With who? Is it by yourself? Is it only with other people? Um, when you're really in that experience of feeling badly about yourself, what's the self-talk that goes on in there? And then we get to really powerful questions, um, which are things like, um, what might someone believe who's having this experience exactly this way? And the most amazing things comes out of people mouth, people's mouths. I mean, it's just astonishing what they'll say. Um, they'll say, I'm in a prison. Oh, I'm really interested in that, you know. Um, and then we end up um, getting, almost just by looking at the present experience of the pattern, at that point we can almost guess what happened in childhood, right? Because it's, it's such a portrait of the meanings that were created uh, in order to get us through some very difficult times. Now, the, the thing that's really important to remember is that even though these patterns and beliefs um, are very um, unwanted and dysfunctional now, at the time they got created by us, they felt like solutions. So if we have a mother who's in pain all the time, and we don't get a lot of attention, and whenever we ask for attention, we get yelled at, then it actually feels better to come upon the idea, the belief, oh, I know why I'm not being attended to. My mom's more important than me. Phew. For a moment there, I thought there was a problem. It's a relief. It's, it's, it's a solution to, in a sense, an unbearable childhood experience. Um, the problem is, is that we move into adulthood and we still have that stabilized because the part of the brain that does the survival patterning doesn't do time. So it doesn't understand things like growing up. It's just kind of permanent learning. Um, it, it, it no longer works. It no longer has the positive meaning and impact in our lives that it once did. Um, and that's how we begin to uncover the pattern. It, it, this is interesting, and I believe very strongly in this, that the present and whatever we're dealing with right here and now, the answers are there. <laughs> the answers are there. Oh, we yeah. can figure out, but as you say, the other piece yeah. is there. And it's, it's kind of like just even listening to you talk as I – reflect back and I think, okay, I could see how as a child it was easier for me to just kind of go off and be my myself and oh, yeah. to to not get involved in a lot of family stuff or decisions because my voice wasn't being heard anyway, so why would I speak up yeah. only to create that pain, so to say. Right. And then you know, so I got very comfortable being on my own, and it, you know, of course, that set in motion not having a lot of friends along the way. Although the friends I did have, I held very dear yeah. um, to me, sort of thing. But it also set these patterns of not speaking my voice, and you know, as you say, placing other people ahead of myself, um, or in relationships, I would just step out of it <laughs> in a sense. Right. 
So I can see these connections that you're talking about, uh, even just in, in listening to you. And while that might have been okay as a child for me to go, well, I'm just going to go play in my room now, yeah. as an adult, I still have to get out in the world and earn a living. I need to communicate with people, and I need to be able to blend into groups and be able to work in groups of people no matter what I'm doing, even if I'm self-employed. I need to be able to do those things. So um, I can definitely see that, that connection. So how do we then take you know, this tool, so then then we start coming yeah. up with phrases to reprogram or how do we get this NLP actually implemented so yeah. I can go, okay, I need this as an adult. I, I, I'm there. Now what do I use? <laughs> Which piece of the toolkit do I pull out? Right. Really good question. Um, as I said, NLP has lots of tools, and some of them are for things that are just, I don't know, we kind of need to tweak a little bit. Yeah. Um, For instance, there's some really good change work patterns, as they are called, um, for let's say you had a really bad breakup um, with somebody and you had to move out of the house, but now you have to pass that house every day to work and it makes you feel horrible. Um, You'd prefer to be able to drive by that house and not feel that horrible. So NLP has a really simple change work tool for that. Now, for the kind of things you and I have been talking about, those are much deeper. They're related to fundamental experiences of belonging and safety. Um, And the main uh, work that NLP offers up for that is something called re-imprinting. The idea is that you know, I, I could give you a lecture or any client a lecture about how you're actually a very worthy person and being in groups is safe. And you, you would nod and, um, and very little would change, right? Um, the place where the meaning yes. has to be updated is kind of in the part of the brain where the meaning got created in the first place. Yeah? So this is how re-imprinting works. Um, if you were my client, I would uh, invite you to imagine that younger version of yourself. Generically, I might choose four, age of four, although in the work that I do with clients, we usually find the precise age that would be most useful to do this at. So just imagine that four-year-old who's learning and acquiring the meaning that being alone keeps her safe. Okay? We're mm-hmm. going to give her five stars for all of her creativity that she's brought to a very difficult situation. And then, like you said, using the other part of the brain, the more adult part of the brain, um, I would come up with a, a resource that you, the adult, Jesse, could agree with fully. Um, usually I need a longer conversation to make sure I've got something I really know will work, but, um, you know, under the circumstances of the radio call, um, we could experiment a little bit. Um, I, I wonder if that four-year-old ever intended being a lot like, well, let me change this between you and me. Are there lots of people who are safe to be with in the world? Um, Are there like good, wonderful, safe people? You know? Yes, there are there are good, wonderful, safe people out there. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd invite you just to step into her and let her know that. She can't know that. She's only four. She hasn't met them. So you slip on into her, fingers in her fingers, toes with her toes, breathe inside of her, feel her heart beating, and just step inside of her with the knowledge you know there are a lot of wonderful people in the world. And someday you're going to meet them. And then if that's working at all, I invite you to just breathe a little bit. And 
anyone on the call can do something very similar for themselves. The four-year-old thinks that, you know, the people in her family are, you know, representative of everybody. Well, just let her know. There are a lot more and different kinds of people in the world. But she's going to want to meet someday. And then I would inquire, how does that feel? And this is a somewhat contrived situation, but... Mm-hmm. And and it definitely feels a little more open. Um, you know, yeah. That four year old and me definitely has some hesitation there, but you bet. Um, yeah. at the same time, I'm letting I'm letting her know that um, there's some really important things we're working on in the world, and. Um, and and so being able to yeah meet these wonderful people there's a lot of wonderful people trying to enter our life and um you know that that want to be a part or to um experience what we have to offer and we might just let and her know that yeah yeah we might just let her know that she's going to have lots of people she wants to be with in the future Yay. No? Yeah. So um, often with clients, I have to do two, three, or four, or five resources. Um, uh, and a, a very obvious one for children, in uh, adults who as children had uh, authentic experiences, perhaps like they were beaten as children or they had incest or um, a lot of violence in the home of one sort or another, one of the resources we will give to the child is that he or she is going to survive this experience. Often what's going on for us is we're holding on to a freeze that happened when we were two or three or four or five, and that part of our consciousness does not know we made it. And once we can inform that part of our consciousness, that's been holding that meaning of, I don't know if I'm going to live, I don't know if I'm going to live, I don't know if I'm going to live. Right? If we can let that part of our consciousness know, we're going to make it. Um, at least a bit of it can relax. Right? It's very rare when one resource does the whole job. Usually we need to bring in two or three or four for um, the entire uh, stress response to be released and the meaning to really be updated in our current day consciousness. But that's how we go about doing it. It's a very cool process in doing this. And um, it's interesting. This is one of those tools that I've naturally done. Um, I bet. As a matter of yeah. fact, when we started doing healing work many, many years ago, and I would work with clients, and it was their childhood self that would show up to me. And that's the self I would talk with um, because I believe if you can shift that childhood self, you automatically shift the adult self right. um, as well. If we are, it's, it's kind of if like, we are, I'm sorry. I was just going to say it's kind of like going back and shifting the timeline, you know, shifting – Yes. The outcome. Yeah, what I like to think of NLP doing, um, we're not so much obviously about changing the history because more or less history is history, although some practitioners may argue even about that. Um, But we change the meaning of the events. And if we can change the meaning of the events, we actually change the experience. So the example I often give is... um, You know, someone is a little kid, through their a substantial part of their childhood, their father would come home at the end of the day, scream, throw things around, be very upset, and the meaning they got out of it is there's something wrong with me. 
And then um, we do some work together, and what we realize historically is that the father had gotten unemployed and was trying so hard to support and care for his family, and he was so ashamed of being unable to do that. And the new meaning we bring in is dad really loved us and wanted to take care of us. And it changes the, the childhood experience in very meaningful ways. Yeah. Um, it doesn't change the details around, you know, what happened uh, in a historical kind of way. But we can go forward with the, the meaning of my dad loved me rather than the meaning of I'm worthless. And that kind of changes everything. That's an excellent way, I think, to present it um, and and how it works. And, and I know in working with codes, you know, there's there's always more than one aspect. It's like here's, it's like saying here's a situation. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> you know, and. Um, so I think that's a great way to say it. Of course, you're not going to change the actual actions that happen, but uh, to change your perception of it, to change your feeling about it, and it's in those feelings, I think, that is where it's so powerful to where we turn, tend to hold on to these different patterns that we've created. Um, well, the, the extra piece for NLP, of course, is having the meaning change at the unconscious level. Because most of us have these meanings updated at the conscious level. I know my dad loved me. You know, it's, not, it's the kind of thing people say. Um, and yet there's, they still have this unconscious, unconsciously driven set of meanings. So it's really there where we need to appreciate the old meanings and see if there's an authentic way for there to be an update. So there can be a meaning that's actually more honoring of actually what happened even if the circumstances were exceptionally um, horrifying. And we do know clients who have had exceptionally horrifying childhood. Um, Mm -hmm. The other piece that's part of this that I really haven't mentioned is that we also want to create a really good picture of what they'd prefer. So um, instead of I'm really quiet and I don't stick up for myself in relationships, I'd really like to stand up for myself in relationships and create a really strong, attractive picture of that future self. Um, so uh, that, that's the other piece is bringing the past, the present, and the future self um, together in kind of a union of intent uh, so that it's kind of a win-win-win for all three when any of them starts to have it any better. Um, that the past self doesn't have to lose if the present self and the future self starts to have it better, that everyone gets to have a better experience of life, (laughs) all versions of us. And that's a good thing. (laughs) When we can experience (laughs) life in a more enjoyable way as a result of it, um, we benefit, but also everybody around us benefits uh, from that as, as well. In things. Yeah. Now, with this process, and I know there's just so many little yeah. variations. You know, it's like going into the screw section of a hardware store, and there's, you know, yeah. a hundred <laughs> different screws there that could be used. Who They're all screws. There's right? so many. Yeah. Or, or nails or clips or whatever. And, and you know, there's a hundred different ones that could be used. But which one are you going to yeah. use now? Um, I know there's some people out there probably thinking, oh, I could probably just delve into this myself. Um, what, do you, what are your thoughts as far as somebody trying to do this themselves? I mean, we're all a little bit different and, you know, in, in some ways, but is there a value to working with somebody like yourself versus trying to do it ourselves? And I can think right off the bat, like, oftentimes, we're either too close or we've left things out that we we can't always get to the questions that need to be asked. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. On our needs. Yeah. Um, you know, there's some really nice, simple NLP patterns 
that most anyone could do on their own. Um, there's a fantastic one, a very early one. Um, this will make you laugh, um, but called a resource cocktail. <laughs> and it's, it's a very nice, simple little pattern, um, particularly applicable if you have a situation coming up like a job interview or you're meeting your in-laws for the first time um, where you're nervous and you're not sure you're going to be your best and you want to be your best. Um, they're just some nice, simple ones that you can kind of do on your own. Having said that, um, uh, like so many modalities, um, trying to learn NLP from a book or a website or even some online courses is kind of like trying to learn skiing uh, by reading a book. <laughs> um, you you kind of got to, you know, you can be on the receiving end of NLP without learning any NLP. So you can go to an NLP practitioner and, and um, have the artistry of someone who's a real master at it. Um, or you can, of course, go off and learn it yourself. Um, and then you can self-apply. Um, and even then, from time to time, when I've got something that's really in one of my blind spots, uh, I will get a fellow practitioner to help me out with it um, because I'm not uh, able quite to um, go observant enough, you know, go up enough levels to really look at it. I'm, not, I'm in it a little bit too much. Um, so, yes, I recommend it. Having said that, um, uh, NLP practitioners, as I said in the beginning, um, vary a great deal upon the lineage they come from. So if you're interested in getting NLP from somebody or, or trying this out, I would recommend looking for a practitioner who underlines that what they do is therapeutic. Um, and then you've probably got someone who's in the right territory for what you're trying to experience. I think that that's a good point, and I'm, I'm glad that you brought up that indeed there are some tools that people can use, and I imagine that is some of the affirmational things like what you've said, um, making that conscious choice to to say, okay, this is what I'm now choosing. And you know, this, this might have worked when I was four, but it's not what I want in my life right now. And uh, so, yeah, I think that there's, that's, I'm glad that you brought up that there are, yes, there are pieces that you can do, and I'm glad you brought up that you yourself will seek somebody out at a certain point with it. Because I think even those of us that have been doing our work for a long, long time, one of the things we realize is we need a little objective point of view of somebody just right. grabbing a little different twist or a little different insight because they're intently focused on listening to some of the things you're saying and some of the actions that you're portraying, not in a judgmental way, but in a way of being able to see or to pick up information that maybe you haven't connected. You might have all the dots, but you haven't connected the dots completely. And the practitioner yeah. helps to connect those dots uh, when you can't necessarily see how to get them connected. So I think that that's a good point. And you have an area of your work that you deal okay. with that really focuses on patterns, and it's called family constellation. Share with us what that's that right. is all about. Yeah, so the nice thing about family constellations and NLP, they come from two completely different worlds. As I said, NLP, the 70s in Santa Cruz. Family constellations comes from Germany via Zululand um, in the 80s. Uh, so very, very different um, uh, origin stories. But what they have in common is, as you said, this interest in, in patterns, and, um, again, NLP is mostly on safety patterns, patterns that stick around with us because some part of our consciousness, our unconscious mind, is still pretty sure that it's not safe for it to be any other way. With family constellations, it's a different set of patterns, and these are the ones that have to do with belonging to our families. 
Um, it turns out that a lot of, and, and for anyone on, on this uh, radio show who has patterns that you've tried a million different ways to change and it's kind of not budging, I very much recommend you to take a look at Family Constellations because it's often the, the, the approach um, that hasn't been taken yet. Um, all of our families, our, our ancestors, have at some time or another suffered, um, whether it's a very personal suffering like the loss of a child or a brother betraying a brother or a murder in the family, or there can be national traumas like the Holocaust or slavery, um, Cherokee Walk of Tears, that kind of thing. Um, these kinds of suffering often can't be integrated or dealt with at the time for whatever reason. You know, culturally they wouldn't let themselves or it was just too big and too difficult or there was a secret involved. Um, or if we're talking about something like slavery, it's, it's too big for any one family to completely integrate that, right? So what happens, um, and this gets to some of your languaging earlier in the radio show, um, there are resonances in the family consciousness of this unresolved, unfinished suffering, this pain. And then you and I pop into our families, and we feel this unresolved pain. And as the founder of Family Constellations, Bert Hellinger, says, children are great in love but small in understanding. And so they come into their families, and they feel all this love, and they feel the pain, and they say, I'll help. I'll help. Um, and then they begin to take it on for themselves. It's not so much an inheritance as it is an unconscious choice. It's a way to belong and to be innocent in our families by sharing the suffering of our family. That can be as simple as, you know, my mom's depressed and she'd be very lonely if I wasn't depressed too, huh? that kind of thing. Um, or it can be something bigger like, um, you know, my grandparents suffered hugely in the Holocaust. How dare I be happy and well when they suffered so much? And again, all of this is, most of this at any rate, is quite unconscious. I'll give you a really beautiful example of this. I had a client who had a very serious problem with overeating, compulsive overeating, and um, we discovered that she had relatives at the siege of Leningrad, which if you don't know the story, was um, Leningrad was sieged by the Nazis, and they went years without food. Um, it was the eating the shoe leather kind of a thing. And millions died of starvation. She had people who had been in that experience. And so out of love for them... She had their hunger, and even though she is not facing starvation, she has plenty of food, right? She, she shares in their hunger, and it, it helps her feel like she belongs, that she's part of who these people are, and in some way perhaps even heals some of the suffering. Again, this is completely unconscious. Until we kicked up this history, she had no idea that this was running, um, her experience. So Family Constellations allows us to take a more proper relationship with that suffering, which is basically to bow to it and to honor the dignity of their fate, and then ask them to bless us to choose a different way, which the ancestors are inevitably happy to do. They would like us to have a better life than they did. You know? And um, at that point, we did that work together, and the compulsive eating, just it just dropped out. It went away. It wasn't an issue of discipline or willpower anymore. Um, so Family Constellations is this beautiful approach to examining our unwanted patterns that may have to do with our unconscious need to belong to our families. Uh, I have one other metaphor for it but, that I just want to share um, imagine that you had a pain in your knee that your doctor did all of the local interventions to fix and it wasn't getting any better 
and then you went to a cranial sacral therapist who thinks systemically about your body, and she says, oh, your, your knee is fine. It's a problem in your neck. And she adjusts your neck, and the pain in your knee goes away. Family constellations work systemically um, under the assumption that many of our life problems are like the pain in the knee. <laughs> And that actually the intervention needs to happen somewhere else systemically in the unconscious of the family soul. Um, and in combination with NLP, it's, it's really powerful because it combines the ancestral patterning with the childhood trauma patterning. And uh, in that way, we can kind of cover both bases. I, I find the family constellation work something that's not just intriguing, but I see this as being really, really powerful work. And as you say, when you start to combine it with NLP or something else too, but even on its own, because as you're talking, I'm thinking about all the empathic people out there Mm. that are and sensitive indigos that just take on everybody else's stuff. They take on the family things. I know in coding, you know, we have the codes that that are our family patterns, as you would say in your work, and that, you know, we we oftentimes continue, uh, as you say, those patterns. So to to ask for this blessing from an ancestor, it's such a simple thing that a lot of people are sitting there going, well, duh, why didn't I (laughs) put that to together in there and but it is it's one of those things that it is embedded and that it's one of those things that I think is becoming more and more evident and more and more of a piece we need to look at because so much of what I see in today's world that's related to anger and different things is really about ancestral things, and it's yeah. not it's not our anger, uh, you know. And I'm going to take something that's probably a really touchy subject. I might be branching out on the limb here, <laughs> and that's racism. Mm-hmm. And so much today, we don't genuinely have a reason to, for example, hate somebody of a different race, and I've been in the position, even as a white person, I've been hated just because I was white, for example. And it had nothing to do with me as a person. It had to do with ancestral things that were going on for people. And a lot of these things are triggered today. A lot of these things are, and this is a hot trigger button because it's one of those areas that it's so easily to trigger people into anger or into these, as I would say, heavy energy spaces um, with it. And when it comes down to it, to be able to reprogram something like that would be incredible because yeah, personally yeah, yeah. I think it's it's what perpetuates wars and a lot of global issues today is carrying on some of these family patterns, and in a way, if we look at it, it connects with the example you gave of NLP and the child, and it may have served our ancestors, but it has no place in our life today. Yeah, and, and, and for many of us, the, the shift can be, for instance, if we look at the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, many of us remember our ancestors as victims, understandably. Some of us on my side, I have getting to slavery. Uh, I have slave traders on my side, so I have ancestors who are perpetrators. Um, but in the case of um, ancestors who are victims, there is this really understandable tendency to say, "Oh, my poor ancestors who are such victims," and that's that's one perfectly legitimate frame. Having said that, when we connect up with the ancestors in the larger unconscious of the family system we discover that they usually say, do not see us as weak. See our strength. 
see that we endured or if we did not endure that we endured as long as we could. See our strength and receive it and live well is usually what we hear the ancestors wanting to say to us because their suffering is over. Thank goodness. So to receive their peace and their strength, uh, as we are the smallest ones, we receive their life and their strength. Yeah. It and reminds that's another me of... Thing. You go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 please, go. I was going to say it reminds me of a story that I recently saw where the, this couple, they're married, and she's preparing this meal that she does every year. And uh, and he he asks her, he goes, why do you do this? Why do you chop this up like this? And she says, well, I don't really know. (laughs) That's the way my mom always did it, and so that's the way I do it. And he goes, well, there must be, you know, she goes, I'm going to call my mom and find out. So she calls her mom and finds, you know, asks her mom. And her mom says, I don't know. That's the way my mom always did it. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, so they call the grandmother and they say, you know, why why did you always do this this way? And she says, oh, well, because the pan I had was too small and it wouldn't fit, so I chopped it up. <laughs> there, was, there was no reason for it. There was no, like, you know, um, it made it taste better or something like that. There was no reason behind it. It was just... In her life, the pan she had to use was too small, and here it carried on all these generations. And uh, so it kind of reminds me of the same thing. So many times we carry something through, and we don't even have a clue why we're carrying it through, or, you know, there's maybe no reason (laughs) to carry it through. Yeah, and and there's definitely these kind of charming, pointless family traditions. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And, and they're harmless in and of themselves. Um, and sometimes they're, even though they're in a sense pointless, they're like, heck, what the heck? Um, it's one way to create that sense of, you know, uh, us in, an, in a positive way. Um, and the kind of stuff the Constellations is usually working with is trauma-based. Suffering, betrayal, intense loss, you know, the family that died in the house fire, um, you know, the father who was murdered, these kinds of things um, that have a very intense impact on the family consciousness. And um, yeah. which the family consciousness has a hard time rebalancing itself from. Uh, so on behalf of the client who's having whatever current day problem they've got um, and have perhaps no idea even about this history, uh we try and bring balance back into the family system and allow, as Bert Hellinger puts it, which I really, really like, is allow the love, the natural love of the family to flow properly again in a way that um, is more proper to what families um, authentically wish to express to each other. Yeah. And I want to invite people. There's a bit of a coincidence today, Jesse. Um, we made this date quite a long time ago, but there's, there's, today's actually an important day. Um, I'm the co-director for the National uh, Constellations Conference this year in San Diego in November. We hold it every two years. Uh, all the best practitioners in North America come and present at this event. And today is the last day of the early bird. <laughs> um, <laughs> When you can save 100 bucks on it. So um, I only raise it because for anyone who's interested or perhaps is on, on this radio show and they've actually been exposed a little bit and they're like, oh, my God, I'd really like to experience more, uh, this is a smorgasbord. You can go to a bunch of workshops, lots of different perspectives, different subspecialties, really dive in. And um, uh, if you uh, uh, would permit me to uh, share that website, I would like to invite people to come. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, definitely share um, it and and whatever information you want to get on that, please do. Yeah, um, so uh, my apologies. It's a longer URL than it ought to be. But it's uh, it's 
constellateus.com slash conference 2015 home. And I'll say that again, constellateus.com slash conference 2015 home. Um, and you'll get all your information there. But if you're finding yourself intrigued, um, today is the day to act because you will save $100 uh, on the early bird uh, uh, entry fee for this conference, which is going to be in San Diego in the middle of November, November 12th to 15th, at a beautiful beachside uh, site venue. We've got this gorgeous spot for it. So I invite everyone to come. Be delighted to have you. And that's and a great time if you're listening to be in to this San Diego. Call after today, if you're listening to this, this radio show after today, then it's still available. Please do come anyway. <laughs> we would like that. <laughs> and, and San Diego in November is, is fantastic. It's, uh, yeah. It really is uh, a good area when you're down there right on the, the beach areas and, and things. There's some, some really wonderful places right in there so but that's really great i you know it's funny i was thinking as you were talking about the family constellation stuff and of course you know when i have a guest on i'm always trying to think about as i'm listening to them talk there's something that's getting triggered for me a lot of times and mm -hmm. and uh, sure. what they're they're saying and i was thinking about because i come from a huge heritage on both mm -hmm. sides of my family work that I do. On one side of the family, I'm at least 13th generation spiritual advisor and, and healer. And on the other side of the family, at least 13th generation juridic practitioner. And so I, I was thinking about when you were talking about the family constellations and, and some of the different challenges I've had in bringing my own work out along the way mm. at different points because I, I weaved in and out of doing things and and like a lot of people you know of course now everything's balancing out now in my life <laughs> but mm -hmm. <laughs> with things that i'm doing but uh i look back in relation to what you're talking and i'm thinking wow i wish i had some of this information a while back in my life when i was first starting out because i would have realized that even with all this family heritage that for example, even in my grandfather's or my great-grandfather's, that they would work through the church so they were never taking any money. And they were working with yeah. members of, of churches and they weren't allowed to take money. And they lived in farming communities where you didn't talk about spiritual things. Um, sure, there's a lot of farming communities in the Midwest that, um, you know, they've got their own Germanic practices or whatever, but uh, hex symbols on the <laughs> on the barns and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. At the same time, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, how many of my ancestors actually took money for what they did? And what was the reason behind them not taking money? And it really mm. wasn't about that they wouldn't have taken money. As a matter of fact, people would send them, like my grandfather, things years later because he helped them without expecting anything along the way. And I'm thinking they probably would have loved to have been able to open up and do some of this work and be paid for it. So it just it was one of those triggers that came to me with the different pieces you're talking about that I think could connect for a lot of people. In, in relation to success things or uh, being able to accept going forward with their work versus taking traditional work. And, you know, I think of that a lot in my family pattern too, uh, relative settling for what will put food on the table versus doing what's really in their heart. Mm. Hmm. And having to make well, that it, constant sacrifice there. So yeah. it's just some of those thoughts that come in when you talk about this family constellations, and it it seems to me like it could open doors for a lot of people 
in some of their their big challenges that they're dealing with. Yeah, and again, there's a lot of there's a lot of themes in what I hear you saying, and a lot of different ways it can show up. But a few things I get curious about is. At, at some point, was did something bad happen with money um, that led to the meaning that having money is dangerous or not such a good thing to have? Um, this often this can happen sometimes, particularly if there's someone who did something not so good with money, and then the family system picks up an association with money that money's not good. Um, another one I've had a number of times, and I didn't hear you say this, but um, it did come to mind, um, of women who feel called to be healers of one flavor or another and clearly had female healers in their lineage who died uh, as perhaps uh, accused witches, that sort of thing. Um, so... I'm sure in my own past life. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah, that's I'm sure that's in the Druid side. Yeah. yeah, in the in the Druid side. And you talk about, you know, as far as money being bad, I'm not sure if it was so much that it was a bad thing as much as perhaps what can oftentimes happen in the spiritual uh, dynamics is and asked of if you start drawing in too much money, you're going to draw a lot of attention. And attention, say, in a medieval time, uh, could have been very damaging if you were a druidic practitioner. They would have come out to pursue you. So I could see actually a connection with both those things that you brought up, that if I start making too much money, there's going to be a lot of eyes on what I'm doing. And if there's a lot of eyes on what I'm doing, I'm going to be burned at the stake. Yeah, exactly. Then the mob comes with the torches and everything. So it's yeah. possible. It's possible. I, now, the nice thing about constellations work is when we, it's a group process. We set up representatives for the various family members and the various elements of the family soul. We actually get confirmation of our theories. Or we find out, oh, my gosh, it's not that at all. It's something else. Um We know we're on the right track when what we're doing creates release in the family system, which the client can quite palpably feel. It's like, oh, finally. I didn't even know that was there, but that's getting seen and included. Oh, thank goodness. (laughs) Um, And it, it can often literally be information they didn't, no one ever, it got lost in terms of the storytelling of the family, um, but it'll show up in the constellation process. The other thing that I just want to name that's often important for people in the Western Hemisphere, especially people in the U.S., is that the experience of immigration, whether it was chosen or forced, often creates a sense of separation from the family tree or the the um, the family soul, um, and and we like to think that's one of our strengths as a people, right? This independence, we're pioneers, we go to new territory, and it is a strength. But it often means that you know, back in the days when there was no Skype, <laughs> not even telegraph, right? Leaving meant leaving, like that's it. That's you know. You never see the parents or the aunts and the uncles or the the cousins again. Um, mm-hmm. And so a lot of people in the Western Hemisphere, and again, especially people in the U.S., are kind of living without connection to their ancestral strength in a very fundamental way. Um, and it's like, as one of my teachers offered up the uh, analogy, it's like running a car on gas fumes in the tank. It kind of chugs along. So for anybody who's listening to this radio show who's who's often felt, you know, I just don't know, life just can't quite get started, 
I don't know why. I'm very smart and capable. Things won't happen. I'd be very curious about their connectedness to their ancestral roots and their willingness to relieve, receive life and strength from their family, from their family soul. Um, this is often an issue for people who had abusive parents and have quite intentionally created a sense of separation, understandably, right? Because it wasn't safe to be close. Um, but inadvertently, at the same time, they've lost connection with the entire set of ancestral strength, which we all really need. Um, one of the things that helps a strong life is to consent that those people had to be where they were for us to be here and not anybody else. And to say okay to the fact that these are our ancestors and not anybody else. And this is often very challenging when there's some really dark stories in our family tree. Um, but the more we can include those stories and allow ourselves to connect with the strength and the life that is there, we find ourselves more here, more rooted, more willing to be here fully, um, even with those, those family realities. So that's a big part of what Family Constellations does as well. And I'm glad that you brought that up. And I, thought, I think it's interesting that you look at the different family members and stuff because I think there can be a lot of different perceptions or misunderstanding in things. Mm -hmm. uh, a mother thinks that she's being loving and providing, and yet, you know, the child may see it as you don't want to be around me, you're always too busy, always doing something else, or, um, you know, other things always seem to take priority, whatever the case is, uh, there. And the mother may not have even realized they were <laughs> portraying that. And the child may not have even realized, as you mentioned earlier in the show, that, hey, uh, you know, they were doing everything they could to put food on the table and give us some sort of life. And uh, so very, very interesting. I, I really like what you're doing with this, and I really like the combination that you're bringing to the table, and um, I love being able to highlight people like yourself and the work mm. that's happening out there, because when I do codes for people, everybody has these different pieces there that is natural for them, and, you know, this is one of those tools that the way you've packaged it, the way you've brought it together, um, I definitely can see being very, very valuable for people. And uh, thank you. Yeah, it's great fun. And, it's great and, fun. And, and, and I, love, I do. In, sorry. And I love, I love how you're coded to your work because when I'm looking to suggest or, or reference somebody, I, you know, I want them to be connected to their work like you're connected to your work in there. Mm. Mm. Well, thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. That's very, very, very affirming. And um, if, if anyone wants to find out more, I'm, I am available for free consultations. Um, again, uh, you can find me at uh, Leslie at LeslieNips.com or at my website, LeslieNips.com. Um, and uh, I'd be delighted to talk with you more if you're, if you're curious or you have some questions. Perfect. And you also mentioned, Leslie, you mentioned the event that you have going on in November in San Diego. Are there any other events that you have going on that are coming up? Um, well, or if you live in the Bay Area, if, if for the listeners who are in the Bay Area, I do do family constellations as a group process every two to three weeks in Berkeley. Um, live constellations are the best way to experience it if you're in the Bay Area. So you can look at my website. I do them very frequently. So, um, And then for those of you who are uh, alternative practitioners and coaches who are struggling in any way with building your practices, again, I'm quite successful in my practice. I figured out some things that <laughs> there's certain ways that we get in our way 
um, in a, a success around being in business that other people in business don't have. <laughs> with, again, with a lot of appreciation for our quirks and, and what we are like. So um, uh, uh, I have a workshop coming up in September that you can join by Google Hangouts or by uh, live again. And I offer other uh, opportunities, other events from time to time uh, uh, around that work of building your business, including I'm starting a four-month uh, business growth program that starts in October. So any of those things you're curious about, please reach out to me, uh, and I'd be happy to talk with you more about them. Well, absolutely wonderful. And, you know, and I know that you can work with people no matter where they are uh, right. along the way as well. So they don't have to just get out to the Bay Area. But, <laughs> but if they're in that area, you definitely have the, the extra abilities for connecting with them or extra options for connecting with them. So, uh, again, I, I want to mention if anybody missed any part of the show, Leslie gave some great examples. Some, uh, actually, the little meditational things that we kind of slipped in there. So you might want to go back and listen to the show from the beginning. And again, her website is lesliemips.com. That's L-E-S-L-I-E-N-I-P-P-S dot com. And Leslie, it's been a real pleasure to have you on Code Connection mm -hmm. today and sharing your work and giving people a chance to learn a little deeper layer of, of what this is all about and to learn a new area that maybe they haven't even heard about. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for making this space, um, both for me and for all these people who listen and for the really beautiful work you do as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And coming up here, uh, again, if you've missed any part of the show, do you go back and listen to it in the archives. It's available immediately afterwards. Uh, I do want to mention that Next week on the show, I'm going to have um, Tara Nichols with me, and you're going to be really interested to see what she has to say. She's an astrologer. She's a shamanic practitioner, and she's going to be talking about the transits that are going on right here and now. And we have a lot of different things that are going on from an astrology point of view, and you know, oftentimes I like to lean to Sharita Starr. She's one of my favorites. But uh, Tara kind of came my way, and I said, well, let's, let's talk about the transit. Sure. <laughs> let's see what we can talk about here. And so she's, she's going to be talking about some of those things that are flying around the universe right now. If you want to tune in for that, it's going to be a little different show. Like I said, I've got some very interesting guests lined up, and we're connecting more and more in this coded aspect and, and taking some really interesting universal wisdom uh, approaches here. You can definitely find out about any of my work through my website. Uh, I have many things on there from monthly specials. I have videos that I put out every month that are on there. It has been getting refined. I've got information up on my code um, interpretation work that I'm doing now. Uh, it hasn't completely synchronized with everything else. I've still got to update a lot of my event pages and things like that. <laughs> but a lot of the website has been updated. I still have pieces on it that I need to work on on to do, but the information is on there, so you can check that out as well. Uh, my books are on there. You can purchase right through there. And mentioning about monthly specials and my books, by the way, if you register for my Autumn Equinox Weekend event, which will be in the Sioux Falls area, you can receive a set of my Activating Compassion books absolutely free for attending that event. And my events, by the way, because they are going to be more focused around code, and it will include code interpretation work as part of what you'll receive through that weekend or through the weekend events. Um, I'm only taking a maximum number of six people on uh, my, my weekend uh, events now. So that's something to keep in mind. If you are interested, you definitely want to reserve your space for that. Uh, I do have some shifts, and there are uh, some price adjustments that are going on, so just let me know. My website is jessianmicholsgeorge, the number one, dot com, and you'll find not only the archived versions of this show and the Activating Compassion shows, but also all of the Main Street Universe shows are on there, and we do have several shows 
we are getting a lot more of just shows that come in and, and are there once a month. So that's going to be something that's going to be interesting to follow here on the Main Street Universe Network. But consistently, we do have Tuesdays. We have Susan Wheat, who shares her work in herbs and natural plants, and she's been doing 13 sacred trees, I believe it is, um, as part of, of a series she's been doing and doing little bits of other things in there as well. Wednesday nights, we have our flagship show with Daniel and Janice, and they've been interviewing some really great musical guests. Mark Slaughter was on just recently, and they had another band on this week. And uh, then oftentimes, Darren Bupera follows up that show. He's a reader at Madame Laveau in New Orleans, and you can get his perspective and his insights about a variety of different things in the spirit world. And uh, and then he also hopes a reading or two. And so if you're looking for really good reading, he's a, he's a great person to get it from. Also check out Kevin Baird's work, who's part of our network, even though he's not formally doing the show right now, at uh, his website, newcompanion.com. That's N-U-Companion.com. And this is Jesse Ann Nichols-George. Thank you so much for being here today. And thanks to all of our listeners, not only through Blog Talk Radio, but those streaming live on Penn known as Fair Encounters Network, Stream Finder, and Talk Stream Live, as well as those that are catching our podcast at iTunes and TuneIn.com and those catching the YouTube version of the show. I definitely look forward to seeing you back here next week as we delve more into code connection. And don't forget, if you've enjoyed the show today, share it with others. It's going to be available at the same link in our archives. And I'm going to leave you with the song Yearning For, also known as Over and Over, which is by Shemshai. And um, again, you can check out more of uh, their work at their website, www.shimshai.com. That's S-H-I-M-S-H-A-I dot com. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you again next week right here on Code Connection. May you enjoy the rest of your weekend and have a truly amazing week. And if I could see what makes me blind I would soar to the edge of my mind And to touch what seems unreal Just to show you the way that I feel And we are in time with time One with season of change inside And we are in tune with the two Caught in a balance of sun and moon
Over and over, life is your lover 